The Boy Who Cried Wolf. Perhaps you can recall the classic Aesop's fable from your own childhood. As passed down originally through the oral tradition, it tells the story of a young shepherd boy. Each day, he raises the alarm of a wolf attack. Each time he does this, the villagers come to his aid. But every time they come to help him, the alarm proves false. There is no wolf. The title itself has become a household phrase used to dismiss those seen as troublemakers. Those who raise their voices but are deemed wrong in doing so. Many may still use the phrase today, so deep are its roots in our culture and our social narratives. But nowhere along the way does anyone ask, why is this boy raising a false alarm? He is dismissed as a troublemaker. Modern audiences may dismiss him as an attention seeker. Perhaps many of you have known or been known as troublemakers. What does this silencing of the boy do to us when we need to raise our own voices? We won't raise them if we think that no one will understand us, no one will come to our aid, no one will even hear what we have to say. So what if instead we see this story from the perspective of a young shepherd boy. The boy who cried wolf becomes a boy who used his voice. Suddenly, his cries for help, whether real or not, become a meaningful expression, not just a waste of time. This is an example of how we shift narratives through the language we choose and the stories that we tell. Now, perhaps this seems like a lot of emphasis on just one line from one fable, but the truth is the language that we use each and every day has a profound impact on us and the people and the worlds around us. Language and our worlds are so deeply interconnected in bio, psycho, and social ways. And I'll briefly dip into what I mean by that. Psychologically, the language we use is intertwined with the way we perceive the world. Whether you're telling a nursery rhyme or telling a friend about your day, the perspective that you choose to take is entirely part of the shaping of your experience. Take the example of telling a friend about your day. Do you tell them about all of the good things that happened? Or do you focus on that one bad thing that got you down? Try it for yourself. Imagine the last time you told a friend about your day. What kind of perspective did you take? Sociologically, language is one of our greatest tools for connection. Through language, we are able to connect with those from all over the world, as well as those within our own tight-knit communities. Our everyday lexicon is built up of our dialect, that is, geographical differences in language, our sociolect, social differences in language, and our idiolect our own personal makeup of language. This can be affected by our gender, our race, our professions and our experiences, among a plethora of other things. Have a think for yourself. What are the unique qualities that make you who you are? How might they affect the way that you use language? Biologically, our language is interwoven in our anatomies. Take the brain, for instance. Whilst traditionally, the cerebellum was considered the zone in the brain used for language processing, we now know, thanks to brain imaging technology, that in actual fact, the majority of the brain 
in some way or another is involved in this process. The parietal and frontal lobes, the emotional and analytical parts of the brain, all come together. And this is one of the reasons this holistic power is what makes language so powerful. And the link between our biology and our language doesn't just stop at the brain. What other part of the body is entirely instrumental in our understanding of the majority of language forms? The mouth, of course. Of the 7,000 plus languages spoken all over the world, every single one that relies on the use of the mouth engages the same parts. Research shows that not only does the shape of our palate affect the way that we speak, but the way in which we speak affects the parts of the mouth that we strengthen and build up on. This is where the link between us and our language goes both ways. See if you can try it for yourself. Really notice where your tongue is in your mouth. Does it come directly to the back of the teeth? Do your teeth fall directly on top of each other? Or is there an underbite or an overbite? Notice every part of the mouth, the lips, the teeth, the tongue, the front, the back, the sides. Even try saying your name. Really notice the different parts of the mouth that you're engaging. And what about your hands? Our hands are so instrumental in our understanding of language, whether that's on a paralinguistic level or in languages that are based upon physical movement, such as BSL. Now, I've shown you a little bit about the power that language has. I've talked through some of the ways we are so deeply interconnected with the language that we use. But if we're going to really use this tool and utilize it, not only for communication, but for change, then we need to understand how. Here are my three top tips to empowered language use. Number one, focus. How specific do you want to be? Let's look back to the boy who cried wolf. In the original title, you can see the use of the specific pronoun the. This places the emphasis, in fact, the blame of the entire story onto that one boy. When I changed the title, however, to a boy who used his voice, I used the non-specific A. This opens up the experience, places the emphasis on the story as a whole. And we can see this in the language of change-making too, the language of politicians and activists. Take, for example, the two phrases, mental illness, and mental health. Mental illness is arguably outdated because of its emphasis on the individual's experience as if something's wrong with them. Mental health, on the other hand, opens up the discussion, engages the entire community on a holistic level, allowing everyone to find their own place along the continuum of well-being. Tip number two is all about imagery, metaphorical language. Now, we can look back to the boy who cried wolf to see an example of this. The boy himself has become an archetype, a metaphor representative of troublemakers. And whilst this imagery doesn't particularly portray him in a positive light, it undoubtedly adds to the power behind the story. We can see the power of metaphor in political language too. Take, for instance, carbon footprint. Now, whilst this phrase has problematic roots, having been invented by Shell as a greenwashing slogan that places the emphasis on climate change onto the individual, it is undoubtedly a powerful phrase, the power of which comes from its metaphorical imagery. 
the tangible thing, a footprint in the ground that we can imagine ourselves leaving. Tip number three is all about angle. Hope or panic. The Boy Who Cried Wolf is a story rooted in panic. We can see this in words like cried. We can see these panic narratives in political arguments too. Take, for example, the climate change focused phrase house on fire. Whilst powerful and emotive, what this does is throws the audience into a state of panic. They imagine themselves in that house. It's in flames. So they try to get out. But when they do, they need to know what to do next. They're thrown into this panic driven, reactive state of fight or flight. Some may try and put out the flames, but others will flee the scene to protect themselves. Hope driven narratives, however, seek to engage the entire community in an empowered way. They seek to act as the water to put out the flames, not just another reminder of the burning house. Language is one of our most powerful tools. And when coupled with our drive to make a permanent difference in the world around us in an active way, it becomes not only a powerful tool for communication, but one for change. It's a skill in every single living being in some way or another, and one that we have the power to control. We can celebrate the roots of our language whilst also engaging in new developments in order to communicate on a broader scale. We can choose the language that matters to us whilst dismissing the language rooted in a history of racism or sexism. And we can choose the stories that we wish to tell. Now, I'm going to finish with a short poem. See if you can notice along the way how a certain tweak in language might make all the difference. Empowered language is all about shaping our voices in order to shape the change we wish to see in the world. This is an example of how I shape mine. This is a sample of State of a Nation. Make a stand and feel. Make something real like a chorus of voices, united, euphoric, raised up to the idea of a moment so historic it could change the way that we've been heading. Raise your voices, one by one, and as you do, those particles from your vocal cords, they move. And they prove that with the strength of many, a difference can be made until these vibrations and reverberations create ripple effects to change a nation. The stories we tell are how we live our lives. How are you living yours? Thank you.